recorded. It's great to have you all there. I can't actually see you and you can't see me either, but in my office, I've got three friends who are looking over my shoulder, one of whom is a technical expert, just in case, but uh, that's all right. Um, normally, as managing director of the Cambridge Aero Club, I introduce the speaker, but as it's me tonight, I probably don't need to say anything. I normally say what a wonderful chap the speaker is. On this occasion, I'll just simply say, I've been flying for nearly 61 years as a solo pilot. I've amassed nearly 10,000 flying hours, flown 200 types, and I've had a lot of fun, and I hope it continue, will continue for a little while longer. The first slide is a um, picture I took in my garden yesterday, and the flowers in my garden are looking really lovely. And I put this in at the start of my talk because you might have noticed the colours of blue and yellow are the colours of Ukraine. And I just thought I would reflect on the sadness that's going on in that part of Europe at the moment. My first flight was when I was two years old with, with my father. It was a funny little airplane called a JL Signet. My father said it was one of the worst airplanes ever built. And one of them survives in a museum in Scotland. Um, the fact of the matter is that it's only one left. And my father said it was one too many. Anyway, I don't look as though I enjoyed the experience that much, but I was brought up in an aviation family. My father joined the Royal Air Force during the Second World War. He joined as a wireless operator, air gunner, and then became a navigator, which he continued doing in a commercial aviation world until he was well into his 70s. On leaving the RAF, he joined BOAC flying flying boats, which he'd been flying towards the latter stage of the war, flew Argonauts, Yorks, Stratocruisers, and Britannias as a 15 year old, I was very lucky to fly around the world with my father and my mother in a Britannia, spending six weeks in Japan before coming over the Pacific with my father navigating. I joined the Air Training Corps as a cadet when I was 13. There you see me in the middle, trussed up for my first ever flight in a chipmunk aircraft. Um, I would go on to fly nearly 2,000 hours in chipmunks in uh, civilian chipmunks, um, but when I was serving in the RAF, and I'll come back to that a little later on. My first solo was on the 21st of March 1961 at Christchurch in this T-31 glider. Um, nice glider, not much of a gliding performance. When the instructor got out of the back, they, he put a lead weight on the tailplane to compensate for the loss of his weight, and I flew solo after 19 launches. It was fairly um, basic instructions. You got to the top of the launch. Um, if you were lucky, you got to 700 feet. You immediately turned left, turned downwind. When you got to between 400 and 500 feet, you turned left. Then you lined yourself up with the runway and you landed. Very few of us spot landed. You were generally at the end of the field. I then had a bit of a pause in flying because that was in March 1961, and it wasn't until 1962 that I joined the Royal Air Force as a Holton apprentice as an engine fitter. As soon as I got to Holton, I went to RF Bista, which was the home of the Windrushers Gliding Club, and continued my gliding. And during my three years of engineering training, I did a lot of gliding. I gained a C gliding certificate, which effectively gave me a half hour's private pilot's license. I only needed to do um, 20 hours to get my PPL, which I did at Luton on Osters in 1964. I went to Luton, to the Luton Flying Club, and presented myself to David Campbell, the CFI, and said, I'd like to learn to fly, please, sir. And he said, how much money have you got? And I said, I got 80 pounds. In those days, it was four pounds and ten shillings an hour to fly but because I had cash in my hand which all good Holton apprentices did at that time of year he said he'd do it for 80 pounds and he did. The reason Holton apprentices had a lot of money in their pockets at that time of year was that we were paid seven guineas a week seven pounds seven shillings and you were only allowed one pound and ten shillings per week of spending money. So at the end of term, there were three terms in a year, you were given a lot of back cash plus 
the money you would earn by your seven guineas a week for your five weeks of summer holidays. So I turned up at Luton at the end of June, got my private pilot's license in the space of a fortnight. I soloed after three hours, 25 minutes, really on the basis that I'd done a hell of a lot of gliding and was quite good at landing. And went to Libya where my parents were, were living um, on the 13th of August, where my father introduced me to a man called Bob Beechler, who was flying Dakotas for a company called Lavco, the Libyan Aviation Oil Company. These Dakotas flew down into the Libyan desert um, to a lot of airstrips, which were where the oil wells were. It was a lot of fun. And during my four, remaining four weeks of summer holidays, I flew about 50 hours in Dakotas as a co-pilot, all strictly unofficial, illegal and unlicensed. They were American registered aircraft. Bob Beachler was a fabulous man to me. He let me fly the airplane a lot, most of the time. And I did a lot of landings and takeoffs. And as a side product, I was allowed to refuel the aircraft on the desert strips. I can tell you with temperatures of about 40 degrees, it was jolly hot work, um, but a lot of fun. The airstrips themselves were semi-level ground, cleared of rocks. Many of the rocks were pieces of timber, which were fossilized timber turned into stone, which had been the trees in the desert in those days. The airstrips were marked out by um, oil on either side of the runway to mark where the runway was, and you found your way there by NDB, all very simple stuff. Um, so by the time I got back to um, England, it was for my final term at Holton, and in my half term in October, I converted to this aeroplane, a Piper Tripacer, and decided to fly with a friend to Munch and Gladbach. It was quite an epic flight. You can see from my logbook that officially, although I'd been flying Dakotas in the desert, I'd actually, when I set out from Munch and Gladbach, only got 32 hours in, in my logbook. It was a bit of a story and I learned a bit about flying from that, and that was plan ahead. It was a foggy morning on the day that I set off to go to Munch and Gladbach. So we drank a lot of coffee and we hung around at um, Luton until the fog cleared. And eventually it did, and we set off. I had to land at Lim, not Lid, very close to where Lid is today to clear customs, and then headed for Munch and Gladbach. You'll see from my logbook that I landed at 16.55 hours in Munch and Gladbach, well, the fact of the matter is, by the time I got there, it was quite dark because I hadn't recognized that I was heading east and the sun went down in the west. Um, there was a bit of difficulty. I think we might have said we were uncertain of our, of our position, but I lined up on the approach lights and, and, and started my approach. As I got lower, I realized that I was trying to land in a car park. So I overshot. A hasty call to Dusseldorf radar. They told me approximately where I was, gave me a heading to steer, and the controller at Munch and Gladbach sent up a lot of lot of flares and rockets, so I identified the airfield properly and landed. Needless to say, I'm relieved that we had a very happy holiday out there with my friend Malcolm Brooks' father, who I took with me, and um, we got back safely. The only uneventful part of the journey going out there was that we drank a rather a lot of coffee. And Malcolm, somewhere over Belgium, said, I desperately need a pee. Well, we hadn't anything to deal with that except a polythene bag that my Aunt Margaret, who we'd stayed with the night before, had given us with some sandwiches. We'd eaten the sandwiches. So Malcolm peed in the bag. Unfortunately, the bag leaked. <laughs> So I slowed down to throw the bag out of the window and alas, um, it came back into the window again. So Malcolm and I were slightly smelly by the time we arrived in, in, in Munch and Gladbach. I left Holton and I bought a tiger moth, a share in a tiger moth. I was commissioned quite soon afterwards and I took the aeroplane with me to my first posting in Norfolk to RAF West Raynham. I based it some of the time at um, 
West Strainham and some of the time at Little Snoring. A lot of fun was had in that Tiger Moth. Spot landings, landings on the beach. Occasionally with one particular friend, we would change cockpits in midair. It seemed a brave and a silly thing to do. And there was absolutely no point because nobody had actually noticed who was sitting in the front seat and who was sitting in the back seat when you landed. We did a bit of flower bombing and I did my courting um, by Tiger Moth. I would fly over um, Mary and my wife's parents farm and do aerobatics, low level aerobatics on Sunday mornings. My then to be mother-in-law would come out with a tablecloth waving it enthusiastically I took that to be a great sign of encouragement. It was only later that she told me she's trying to send me away. One of the other things I did with the Tiger Moth a lot of was um, flying RAF fighter pilots' wives and the fighter pilots themselves. We had two squadrons of hunters at West Raynham and they all wanted to experience the joys of a Tiger Moth flight. One person I flew on the way to the airfield was talking lots and lots about, can it do aerobatics? Will it do this? And when we got into the air, we had primitive um, communications. And she said something, so I looped the loop. And it was only when she land we landed that she said, I'd actually ask you how I blow my nose. Um, anyway, it had a side product because in those days, the hunter was leaving operational service. And in exchange for all the flights I gave to wives and fighter pilots, I was given quite a lot of flying in the Hawker Hunter and during my time at West Raynham I probably did about 20 or 30 hours in the Hunter and despite the lack of any previous jet training became reasonably proficient. The other great joy of being at um, West Raynham was that while I was there they were making a terrible film uh, called Mosquito Squadron. Somebody I'd known through my Tiger Moth, Taffy Rich, who happened to have worked at Langham with um, marshals of, of Cambridge in the 1950s. Taffy was the chief flying instructor of, of, the, Air, of the Norfolk and Norwich Club at, um, at Swanton Morley. And there were three mosquitoes parked out on the pan and Taffy Rich was wandering across and I hailed him. He was very pleased to see me and said, would you like a ride in a mosquito? And I said, gosh, would I? And so I found myself sitting in the second pilot seat of a mosquito alongside two other mosquitoes attacking the North Norfolk coast while they made this terrible film. Um, if you look closely, you can probably see me on the film. Um, it was a wonderful experience. I felt quite sick and it was quite hot in there, but it was a wonderful experience for a young pilot. It was not long after that, after, that I left West Raynham, and I supposed to RAF Stanbridge and I became involved with the Girls Venture Corps Air Cadets. Here you see a photograph of me with <clears throat> three young cadets. The Girls Venture Corps had bought a Jodel by, by collecting green shield stamps. Mostly the pilots were female, mostly they were ex-ATA pilots, and we had a tremendous amount of fun. As a result of that, I got to know a lot of ATA pilots and one abiding memory was flying with the legendary Joan Hughes, who would check us out each year in the Jodel to see if we were fit to fly the cadets for another year. Flying with Joan in the circuit of, 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 um, of Booker, now Wickham Air Park, we flew through a, a rain shower and there was a perfect rainbow at the wingtip with Joan smiling at me saying, isn't it wonderful? We did a lot of cross country. Um, the way it worked is we'd fly the airplane across the country and fly lots and lots of cadets. One weekend at Blackpool, we fly cadets three at a time. One weekend at Blackpool, I flew something like 60 cadets on a Saturday and a Sunday. Sometimes if it was going to be a very busy day, a second pilot would, would come along, but mostly it was solo. One particular flight lives in my memory. I'd been flying cadets at, at Plymouth and it had been a lovely day, very suitable for flying. But at the end of the day, um, some cloud rolled in over Dartmoor and I was worried about getting back to Red Hill, which is where the air, aircraft was based. But a, a pilot of a commercial airliner that landed at Plymouth said, oh, it's perfectly clear to the, to, the, um, to the east, just take off, fly over the cloud and you'll be fine. And that's exactly what I did. 
Unfortunately, the Jodel didn't have any navigational aids at all. I just had a map and a stopwatch and a heading. Uh, when I was approximately where I should be approaching Red Hill, I was just over solid cloud. So I had to call Gatwick on the radio and in a very calm voice, ask for a letdown, which they provided me with. I landed, was met by the lovely Diana Bernardo Walker, who either put some whiskey or some gin in me, I can't really remember, but it was a lot of flying. On one trip, I took a cadet in the top to top air race. We've, the idea was to go from the top of the Blackpool Tower to the top of Snay Fell. It involved a motorbike at both ends, me in the middle. Our flight time from Blackpool to Snay Fell was about 12 minutes, low level. We had to climb to avoid a ship which inconveniently got in the way. And as usual, the weather was filthy. The other memory I have of um, flying that Jodel, one of the checkout years, we all turned up, all of the pilots together to be checked out by turn. And by luck, I was the first person to be checked out. I passed, the next person was Daphne. Daphne was an aging ATA pilot, not her real name actually. And she was slightly plumper than she might have been. And she lowered her body into the seat of the airplane and the back of the seat promptly broke. As she fell backwards into the rear seat, she reached forward to stop herself falling backwards, got a hold of the instrument panel and that fell into the back seat with her. So that was flying finished for that particular day. That was all when I was stationed at RAF Stanbridge and it continued. I continued as a Girls Venture Corps um, cadet flying them until about 10 years ago. In later years, they gave up using their own airplanes and we flew them in rented airplanes. At Stanbridge, I continued to fly the Tiger Moth, having um, no longer a share or ownership of a Tiger Moth. And I flew with the London Gliding Club, flying their Tiger Moth, towing up gliders. A lot of fun. I, they would use the Tigers during the daytime to fly their members. And then in the evenings, they would have business groups. Various people would come along to fly and I would be the tug pilot to do that. We'd do it three, four, five nights a week. I probably did the best part of 800 hours flying Tiger Moss during my two year tour. And that sort of reminds me of another lesson I learned about flying. I got to the airfield early the Tiger Moth had been finished with, with the day's operations and Jeff, who'd been flying it previously, said, oh, it's all refueled, it's ready for you, it's out at the strip. So I went out, lay on the grass, it was a warm evening, looked at the aeroplane. I didn't bother to check it out because Jeff said he'd done it. And while I was laying there, I saw a drip of oil underneath the aeroplane and it just made me quizzical. And I went and looked at the oil tank and surprise, surprise, the dipstick showed it was completely empty. Jeff had done the fuel, but not the oil. And never again did I trust anybody to do a pre-flight check on an airplane for me. I carried on gliding throughout my Air Force career. Um, I spent a lot of time in France and this particular photograph is taken over, over the French Alps. I gained my diamond height through a flight to 26,000 feet over the French Alps from Sisteron. It was a fascinating flight. Late in the afternoon in standing wave, the colors of, of the evening sky were absolutely wonderful. And I was sort of lost in my own universe when the radio crackled into life and said, was I ever coming down? And I looked at my watch and thought, yes, I must. And from 26,000 feet in a glider, takes about 20 minutes to descend, otherwise you'll do damage to the airframe as a result of it warming up from cold soak. I came down and it was quite dark, but they knew I was coming. I called um, three minutes to landing and I could see where the airfield was. They laid out a, a, a flare path with, with headlights of cars for me to land. But the thing I always wanted to do in a glider was glide in different mountains. Everybody had been to Scotland, everybody had been to Wales, we'd all 
all been to France. But the great target was the Andes. And in 1995, I took an RAF expedition to Chile um, with the aim of flying over Mount Aconcagua, the highest mountain in the Americas at um, just under 23,000 feet. It was a blissful four weeks flying Janus gliders, which we'd use the RAF Gliding and Soaring Association's spending power in order to buy um, five new gliders for the Chilean Air Force at a discount price. We worked our way into the mountains over the three weeks we were there, enjoying some fabulous and spectacular scenery until we managed to find our way out to um, Mount Aconcagua, which we soared to the top and got to the very top. It was uh, amazing flying there. And if I have two abiding memories of Mount Aconcagua, one was from the top of it looking down to base camp and seeing a cacophony of color, red, blue, green, yellow, orange, lots of tents which were left there by climbers as their base camp and they'd never taken them back. The other abiding memory, which was even more stark, was flying very close to the edge of the mountain, as you see here, coming around a corner and being confronted by five Japanese climbers hanging on a piece of rope going up the hill. I'm not sure who was more surprised, um, the, the climbers or, or me. The good luck was I missed them and I don't think anyone fell off. I continued my gliding, I was a gliding instructor, flying mostly um, K21 gliders, as you see here, this is uh, an RF um, Gliding Association glider. I taught my young son, Robin. Robin um, went solo with the air cadets at Swanton Morley at a, an air training corps, voluntary gliding school. But then he came gliding with me at Bista. And one of my happiest memories was having sent him off gliding for a five hour flight as part of his um, Silver Sea qualification in this K-18 glider. I was instructing all day and towards the end of the day, as he, I think he'd done about four hours, I joined him in a thermal. And at about 4,000 feet, we were just opposite each other in return, waving madly away, a very happy memory. It was gliding that um, got me into a Spitfire. I'm sure you all know Carolyn Grace and her two-seat Spitfire. Well, I'd known Carolyn for quite a while and at a, at a party, I asked her if she'd ever flown a glider and she said she hadn't. So I said, well, why don't you come to Vista and fly a glider? She said she'd love to, and she did. I did the three obligatory minimum flights with her in the morning in this particular glider, Romeo 21, and she went off solo, landed, we had some lunch together, and then after lunch, it was soarable. So we went up together, we soared together, and we got up to about four and a half thousand feet. I pulled the air brakes and we landed. What are you doing? She squawked. I said, well, uh, you're going off on your own now. So she went off and did an hour and a half as a soaring flight. She was ecstatic. And about a week later, I had a thank you letter from her, which enclosed a set of pilot's notes from Mark 9 Spitfire. Her thank you note said simply, read these, you're gonna need to. And about a month later, I was summoned to go to Duxford to fly her Spitfire. A nice chap called Bob Davey, who was the CAA's um, chief test pilot, sat in the back and I think I was unique in being the first person to fly Carolyn's Spitfire from the front. Very generous of her and it's like a lot of things in life, you can't do it until you've done it before, but that enabled me to do it again. It also allowed me to fly a Mustang thanks to the generosity of a very good friend, Maxie Gainzer. But I carried on flying with chipmunks and I mentioned earlier that I I probably got just under 2,000 hours in chipmunks. I was the Czech pilot for the RAF Gliding and Soaring Association. Spent a lot of time flying these super chipmunks, towing up gliders, checking other people out. We had a Piper Pawnee in the RAF Gliding and Soaring Association as well. I flew those and today I still fly um, a Pawnee flying at Bridgewell with the Essex Gliding Club. 
here you see a typical picture from the glider of the tug. Um, ideally, the rope ought to be rather straighter. And there's a, a lesson in briefings from this picture as well. It was late in the day and the glider pilot said he'd like a trip up to 5,000 feet. There wasn't much of a briefing. I said I'd drop him at Stratashaw, which was just to the north of, of Ridgewell, and I did. The visibility wasn't great. If you're looking carefully, you can see I'm pointing north. He pulled off at 5,000 feet. I turned very gently. I waggled my wings and dived towards Ridgewell Airfield. When he landed, I said, Matt, you must have had a terrific flight. He said, God, I got lost. I couldn't see Stradishal. I didn't know where the airfield was. I said, didn't you see me waving and pointing to the airfield? Oh, he said, I just thought you were waving your wings. So there's a good case for better briefings. I still at Ridgewell fly gliders um, and I still enjoy it. This is nothing to do with me at all. It's just a silly photograph of a parachutist, which reminds me that when I had the tiger moth at Little Snoring, somebody appeared at the airfield with a parachute under his arm and said, would I allow him to jump out of my tiger moth? And I couldn't see any reason for saying no. So I said, yes. I flew him up as high as I possibly could. He jumped out, seemingly happy, and that was that. I did a parachuting course myself I, when I was in RAF Bimbrook. I caught chicken pox from my daughter. And whilst I was recovering, I went on a free fall parachuting course and did 19 jumps. And while I was there at Netheravon, I was introduced to the Britain Norman Islander. And I went on to fly the Islander, um, both the piston engine version and this version, which is the gas turbine one, dropping parachutists, as well as the Pilatus Porter. And when I was at Bimbrook, um, the Cessna 206 at nearby Sturgate. I also did a bit of ballooning, which was a lot of fun. This was one balloon flight from Bicester on a very foggy morning. I have this wonderful memory of emerging through the fog, coming out into brilliant uh, sunlight at the, at, the, at the top of it all. Bimbrook had the lightning fighter. And again, I was that lucky that I was there at the end of the lightning's life. The airplane had a lot of hours left on it. There was no real future. They had a lot of two seaters and generously they gave me lots and lots of opportunity to fly in the lightning, which I enjoyed enormously. One story comes to mind. I was flying with a really good friend, Nigel Tufts, Tuffy. We were way out over the North Sea, half in and out of cloud at about 20,000 feet, when suddenly the instrument panel lit up um, all sorts of warnings came on. We had a total electrical failure. I knew it was serious because Tuffy sort of wiggled his bottom into the back of his ejection seat and pulled his strap seat tight. I took that as a hint and did the same. The intercom had failed and we couldn't talk to each other, but he'd managed to get a quick mayday call out and we headed back towards Bimbrook. Tuffy was writing notes on his notepad with his wax, wax crayon um, telling me that we may have to eject, we have to do it over the water, and we, he wasn't quite sure. And then suddenly a lightning appeared on our right wing, just like this, there's a chap called Jim Wilde. Amazingly, he was airborne at the same time. Amazingly, his radar was serviceable. The lightning radar normally lasted about 10 minutes. Um, we then sat on his wing and he led us back into Bimbrook where we landed uneventfully. I've got a picture of the event which was painted by um, Eric Day, the aviation artist, and Jim Wilde got, a, got an endorsement in his logbook for, for saving us. Uh, I think that was the closest I got to real danger. A little later in my RAF career, on promotion to group captain, I was put in charge of a lot of airplanes, mostly aging airplanes. It included the Canberras and I managed to bag a few flights in the Canberras from Witten, but joy of joy, I was in charge of all the engineering on the Battle of Britain Memorial flight. I also, in, I introduced the Dakota into RAF service um, 
whilst I was in charge of BBMF, that involved a lot of trips to um, to Coventry to Air Atlantique. But joy of joy, I got to fly the Lancaster, sitting in the right-hand seat on a flight from Coningsby to Jersey for the Jersey air display one September. It wasn't all plain sailing because at the time of the flight, when I was in the mid upper turret, I wandered around the airplane, as did the other passengers, there were two others, um, Wackett Evans, who ran a company called Aviation Jersey that used to do all the maintenance on the Merlins was in the airplane as well. And while I was in the, in the cockpit, in, in the mid upper turret of the Lancaster, suddenly through the headphones came mayday, 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 hurricane engine failure. We'd got a hurricane on one wing and a Spitfire on the other wing. We circled and watched the hurricane with Al Martin aboard. Um, sadly, didn't quite make it to Wittering. He crashed on the runway, burst into flames. We watched Al hop out with a broken ankle through the flames. And it was a slightly somber Lancaster crew that uh, landed at Jersey, particularly Paul Wackett Evans, who knew that the hurricane had gone down because of an engine failure. The airplane which I had a lot of hours in and also had responsibility for was the Hawk. I, we had Hawks based at Coningsby, Broadie and Chivener. And I used to have to visit, normally with one of my wing commanders, all the stations quite a lot. And I was given quite a lot of Hawk flying. In those days, I had a Jodel, this particular aircraft, a delightful airplane. I had lots of adventures in it, including taking my son Robin to France. We didn't quite make it to France because weather forecasting wasn't quite as good as it should have been. We left Bicester in bright sun, got to the south coast and then had to land at Lyd, where we spent the night before going to France the next day, only to discover that France was closed because it was Bastille Day. Anyway, back to the Jodel and Hawks. I'd been with Mike Herkham, one of my wing commanders, to Broadie, and it was a lovely summer's evening. Coming back with the sun behind us, you could almost see for 50 miles, and we flew back towards Bicester. I made the obligatory radio call, which nobody answered. They were flying. It was an evening about seven o'clock. I could see the, the gliders on the field. I began my approach. And suddenly, as I was about a mile final, maybe less than a mile final, suddenly a glider went up the wire. And I did what I'd been doing in the Hawk the previous week, or the previous couple of days. I banked hard, I pulled, and to my great surprise, I found I was in a spin at about 400 feet. Uh, I was over a housing estate, but luckily in the middle of the housing estate, was a large grass playing field. If the playing field hadn't been there, I swear I would have hit the roofs of the houses. If there'd been a football um, net up on the playing field, I'm certain I would have gone in it. Mike Herkham, who was sitting beside me, said I was chanting all the time, speed, 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 because I knew that if I tried to recover, I'd recovered from the spin quite quickly, but I was slow and I knew that I needed speed. And if I pulled out of the dive before I had, had sufficient speed, I'd stall the game. We made it by inches, landed at Bicester quite shaken. I was debriefing Mike and saying how sorry I was when the phone rang in the office. It was somebody complaining about who was doing aerobatics over, over the housing estate. I apologized profusely to him as well. I was also lucky to be responsible for the Phantom in our air service, and that gave me a bit of flying in the Phantom. This particular photograph was taken at the end of the last flight of an F4J. And looking behind me in my office on the shelf, there's a stick top from that particular F4J. Um, Mike Olcott, who was the station commander, had given me the flight, I landed it, taxied it back to the parking in front of the house. The, the liney, the line technician came up on the steps, um, put, the, put the pins in and made, made, the, made the seat safe and the canopy safe. And then suddenly he was down scrabbling between my legs. I wondered what he was up to. And he was removing the stick top. Here you are, sir, he said, you better have this. 
this old girl won't need that again. And he did the same to Tony Alcock in the other cockpit. During that tour, the Hawk and the Phantom were both um, looked after by BA Systems at Bruff, which took me to Bruff quite a lot. And at that time, BA Systems were trying to market the PC-9 as a competitor to the Tucano from the RAF trainer. I managed to fly that a lot as well. But joy of joys, I also flew quite a few times the Blackburn B2 that you see here. Occasionally people ask me if I've flown a helicopter and the answer is yes, but not very well. But it all came about because of this chap on the right hand side of the picture, Robert Webb Bowen. Rob and I did the RAF Staff College course together at Bracknell when I finished at Bimbrook. And at the end of the course, I was posted as wing commander to Germany to Rheindahl and to the headquarters. Rob was posted to um, Hildesheim where he commanded a link squadron, anti-tank squadron, but they had a couple of gazelles. Now you needed to be a general to, to get a, a ride in a helicopter from um, Rheindahl and up to the forward area. So, but Rob would always send a helicopter for me. So I had to secretly get into it at Vegberg, at Vegberg Strip, about three miles from Rheindahlen. Rob was determined that I would learn to fly the helicopter. So he sent the same qualified helicopter instructor every time to, to fly me up to Hildesheim. After we'd done about six or eight trips and I'd done probably 12 hours in the Gazelle, I'd read the pilot's notes and done the various things. On the way up to Hildesheim on a lovely day, the warrant officer said, all right, sir, see that big field down there? I'd like you to land at the top, hover taxi on the, on the upwind side end of the field, then hover taxi downwind, do a figure of eight as you do it, and then land. And I landed and he undid his straps and got out and said, right, sir, I'm just gonna go and spend a penny. He probably didn't actually say that. He said, I want you to take off I want you to do one circuit of this field. I want you to land and pick me up. I did that with a huge grin on my face. Then we got to Hildesheim where Rob, who was in the know, was waiting with a glass of champagne. I turned to the warrant officer and said, gosh, that was fantastic. Thanks so much. What do I put in my logbook? He said, sir, you put fuck nothing. And that was that. It had a sort of benefit in later life because I had to do a study as a group captain um, into the relocation of the RAF Gliding and Soaring Association Centre. And my friend Niall Irving, who was Sasso of one group who commissioned the study, said, had I flown a helicopter before, I admitted I had. So he gave me a Wessex helicopter and a qualified helicopter instructor to do the study. I had to go to five RAF units to look at them all. And if I had been a clever person, I'd have gone from High Wycombe to A to B to C to D to E, and then back to High Wycombe and spent a night somewhere. I wasn't that clever. So over four successive days, I went from High Wycombe to A, back to High Wycombe, the next day to B and back to High Wycombe and got a few hours in the Wessex. It was great fun. Fun had to end and I joined Marsh of Cambridge and had even more fun. I spent a lot of time, particularly in the early years, flying the Aztec. We didn't have quite so many test pilots in those days, and they always wanted a pilot to fly the Aztec to either deliver a crew to line them or bring them back. And I flew the Marshall Aztec for a lot of hours. But before I got the job, I had to have an interview. That involved an interview with Michael Marshall by myself and then accompanied by my wife going to have another interview and Marion was sent up to Swaffham Prior House to meet um, Sybil Marshall, later Lady Marshall. And Sybil turned to Marion and said, um, I don't think I know your husband, do I? And Marion looked down at the coffee table and there was a copy of Harper's and Queen's magazine there and she said, oh, if you'd read your Harper's and Queen's, you'd see a photograph of my husband in there. And uh, there was, I'd been invited by Rob Lamplow, the owner of this book, a Jungmeister, to take it to the British Historic Grand Prix at Silverstone.
to display it and fly it back to his strip. And this is the photograph that was in Harper's and Queen's and which probably got my, me my job at Marshall. So for that, I'm very grateful. The other airplane I flew a great deal at Marshall was this one, Michael Marshall's Rally Minerva, a lovely airplane. And together we flew it throughout Europe, around the Mediterranean, to all sorts of places. And I've probably got about 1,500 hours in that Minerva. One delightful flight sticks out absolutely in my memory, which was just before Michael died. He and I were planning to go to Morocco in the Minerva, and he wasn't sure how high it would go. And he wanted to see if it would go over the Atlas Mountains. So on a delightful day on the 26th of June, we flew up over North Norfolk and started to climb to see how high we could get. Here you can see that we're just passing through um, 11 and feet. And I said to Michael before we left that we couldn't go above 12,000 feet because if we were going above 12,000 feet, we needed oxygen. And we all really ought to have been on oxygen well before um, 10,000 feet. Anyway, we're still in the climb at 11,500 feet, aiming for 12. From the vertical speed indicator, you can see we've got about 200 foot per minute climb. Michael turned to me with a smile and said, um, what happens if we go above 12,000 feet? Do we get prosecuted? And I said, no, we might pass out. Um, he just laughed and said, well, in that case, let's keep on going. So we kept on going and we made it up to just over 14,000 feet, which was an absolutely blissful flight. And from this photograph, you can see some of the ground and some of the view, that's Scott Heads um, in North Norfolk. I was often allowed to use the Minerva for my own purposes, and it was a delightful way to go out for lunch with friends. There you see my wife, our small, our small grandson, he's now 22, and a pug. I also had a hornet moth while I was at um, with Marshall in the early days. Delightful aeroplane it was too. And I did a huge amount of, um, of flying in it to various de Havilland moth rallies, um, to the reenactment of, of the um, Mel Mildenhall to Melbourne air race. I did the first one in a hornet moth in 1984, which was the 50th anniversary. This photograph was taken at the 2009 celebration when we flew um, into Mildenhall, Henry Lavisher on the rest, left and Tim Williams on the right. For the 50th anniversary one, I was flying a friend, Simon Bostock's Hornet Moth. We were waved off by Donald Bennett, the pathfinder who'd taken <coughs> place part in the original air race in 1934. And all of us did indeed fly from Mildenhall to Melbourne. In the case of the majority of us, we flew to Melbourne in Cambridgeshire, landed at Oakington and had a, a jolly good barbecue. These two turned left and flew to Melbourne, Australia in Tim's Puss Moth. All of my time at Marshall, I've had a real love and affinity of the Cambridge Aero Club, of which I'm managing director. For those of you who are not Cambridge Aero Club members, this is the advertisement in the middle of the talk. Well, it's not quite in the middle. We've gone beyond that. Just to say, we've got two Cessna 172s, three 152s, a 182, and an extra. During my time, I've flown people from this man aged 100 and for his 100th birthday on the very day, I flew him over Thurlow. The youngest person I've flown in a Cambridge Aero Club machine is Imogen, my granddaughter, who I think was three at the time. Throughout my time at the Aero Club, I've really tried to encourage formation flying. Uh, we've done a lot of it at various company air displays. But probably the most fun I had was flying in formation with Howard Cook in one of the Cambridge flying group, Tiger Moths. Um, we represented the old flying training machine and the new flying training machine. It was fun. It was quite difficult keeping behind a tiger and keeping station with him. You can see the flaps are down. Um, I needed energy and power and I needed drag. My daughter, who's probably listening to this um, talk, 
lived in America for a while. I hold American licenses as well as British ones. I've done a lot of flying in America. I would hire a Cessna 172 from Westchester. And my absolute favorite journey was down the Hudson River. Take off from Westchester, turn left, descend to a thousand feet, talk to LaGuardia, and then just fly down the Hudson. This is the very spot where Sully Sonnenberger um, went splash down to the tower, um, down to Liberty, then turn left up the West River, having a good look at the new um, World Trade Center building over Central Park and back to Westchester. A delightful journey. If only I had more time, I could talk for hours about that, but I've only got about 12 or 14 minutes left. I wanted to mention the Air League. I've been a member of the Air League for some while. Today I'm its life vice president, one of a few. And I was delighted that I was presented with a Quill Medal about seven years ago for my work with young people and encouraging air mindedness. But it provides me with an opportunity to tell you about my first ever engine failure. We were lent a dove, de Havilland dove, by a very good friend, um, David Trufkan, to fly a group of um, Air League people to Toulouse to visit Airbus. I was flying it with my good friend, David Hare, who I was about to fly the Atlantic with. And on the way back from Toulouse, at 5,000 feet in the cruise, the left engine gauge oil pressure started to wobble, and the temperature went up. We watched it for a few minutes, and then decided to feather the engine. A diversion was necessary. We were midway between Le Mans and Deauville. Deauville was further north with a, a slight tailwind. We decided to go to Deauville. Our first radio call to Deauville was Mayday because by that time, at nearly max continuous power to stay in the air, the other engine was beginning to suffer as well. Um, at the time of the first engine going and the feathering, um, the director of the Air League, Eddie Cox, was standing in the doorway talking to us. He quickly evaporated and went to the back. After, we, after I safely landed it at um, Deauville, the air traffic controller came out and said, oh, thank you so much for keeping your microphone live. We hear everything you say in the cockpit. Well, I hadn't realized we got a live microphone. It was just that the ropey old dove it, the Presta transmitter just stuck on. And to this day, I don't know what we said, but anyway, he enjoyed listening to us. Sequel to the story was we checked, there's oil splattered all over the side of the fuselage. We phoned up the aircraft owner and confessed that the engines had gone wrong and we were stuck at Deauville. A lot of abuse came at us. Oh, you bastard, you've, you were flying at the wrong engine settings, which wasn't actually true at all. Anyway, a week later, he sent out an engineer with loads of oil. They filled up the engines with oil, wiped all the oil off, um, started it up, tested the engines. Everything seemed perfectly well. And so it was flown back to England. Sensibly, they did the short water crossing via the 2K and then had to land and divert into lid because the airplane did the same thing again. Um, the piston rings had broken and that was the end of it. I've been a member of the Royal Air Squadron for a number of years and I'm its Vice Commodore and I've had most enormous pleasure from flying with the Air Squadron. In the 30 years I've been a member, I've been on a number of trips. I suppose the one that sticks out most in my mind was the one to America in 2000. I flew with David Hare, who I mentioned a moment ago, in his um, Red Aztec we left Cambridge one Saturday morning, spent Saturday night in Iceland, and Sunday we were in um, Goose Bay in Labrador. The flight across the Atlantic involved um, making position reports every hour. We didn't have an HF radio, so we would call up on 1215, um, the emergency guard frequency, and just say, uh, Golf Tango Alpha Paparecco, request position report and a voice would come up from an airliner and say, okay, this is American, one four, 
pass your message and we'd pass the position report and about five minutes later he'd come back and say okay Papa Echo, uh, we passed that now what are you doing down there on one occasion one position report i think it was a virgin aircraft they brought a stewardess up into the cockpit to talk to us they were so sorry for us they didn't realize that david's wife margaret was sitting in the back but it was nice of them to think about us we landed at Narsasarak um, for fuel in, um, in Greenland, a most amazing airfield. You can only land in one direction because of a mountain, and you can only take off in the other because of the mountain behind you. In poor weather conditions, you have to come up the fjord via a letdown at an NDB called Simutak. On this particular occasion, um, we were blessed with bright blue skies, so we just went into the overhead and let down. But on the way out of, um, of, of Narsasarak, my friend Ian McFadgen was there with John Hogg in his Beach Baron. So I led, we did a formation stream takeoff, Ian formated, and we flew down the fjord um, on our way um, a, across to Goose Bay. It was a long trip. We were away for three weeks. Our first proper stop in the United States was at Andrews Air Force Base, where we sat in Air Force Two. This is Mary and my wife and I sitting in the vice president's seat. John Cunningham, the cat size Cunningham, the um, former de Havilland test pilot who I flew a few times in my Hornet Moth was, was there to meet us. He flew into Andrews in a Leopard Moth, which had been positioned there by Henry Labashair. A great joy to see the Grand Canyon and to land parallel to coming down beside the strip in Las Vegas, a remarkable experience. In my last five minutes, I'm just going to scamper through a few of the other air squadron trips. Spain and Gibraltar were wonderful. It was always said that in the Royal Air Force, you could only land at Gibraltar if you'd landed at Gibraltar before. Well, Michael Marshall and I did it in his Minerva, and we had a fabulous time. One of the abiding memories of Gibraltar was the Barbary Apes, which sat out on the balconies of the Rock Hotel and banged at the windows. They knew that if you banged hard enough, the windows would spring open. They could get in and eat the, eat the fruit and biscuits that were on the bed. One of our friends, Olaf Brun, came down to lunch and said, I've just got up to my room and found a, a monkey in there. We said, what did you do? He said, oh, I took its photograph. Another trip was to Norway. We went to Norway one June in the hope and expectation of seeing the mountains and having bright sun. For the whole of the week, we flew around at about a thousand feet in dreadful weather, but we had a lot of fun. We went as far north as Tromso, and there you see typical views flying past Bardafoss. I mentioned my friend Tim Williams, who flew in his Puss Moth to Melbourne. I flew with him to Venice in the Puss Moth, sharing the flying, probably about um, six years ago now. A most delightful flight, an abiding memory of going over the Simplon Pass at about nine o'clock one morning. We struggled to get height, and I guess we were over the top of the pass at about 100 feet, looking down at people in the car park, looking up at us, Flying in that 1932 machine, we must have been a vision from another age. We landed at the Lido airport in Venice, which you can see, that's the green bit right in the middle of the shot. On the way back, we landed at Como and flew this Caproni um, float plane. It's actually a Caproni Italian built de Havilland uh, 60 moth on floats. It's the oldest float plane in the world. On another trip, we went to Sweden in the Baltic. Swedish Air Force were our hosts, and they had these Saab 105 training aircraft. Some of them had been modified into two-seaters, into four-seaters, and we were given a trip in, in the Saab 105. It was an amusing flight because we flew in our shirt sleeves with a basic David Clark headset, whilst the pilot, who generously allowed me to fly the airplane, sat beside me like a proper fighter pilot, dressed up like Darth Vader. We then, from Sweden, 
went across um, to Tallinn in Estonia. We flew over a, a Russian um, um, whiskey submarine, which you see beneath us. And there is our Royal Air Squadron fleet of aircraft at Tallinn. Um, at one end of the dispersal are five typhoons, which we visited. Another memorable Royal Yacht Squadron, uh, Royal Air Squadron trip was to help celebrate the 200th anniversary of the Royal Yacht Squadron when I led a formation of moths and piper cubs. I was flying a piper cub in the lead with its owner Martin Barraclough behind me. The last long distance trip we made with Michael Marshall sitting in the back was to Malta and one of my friends Bruno Schroeder allowed me to fly in the front of his uh, PC-12 to Malta. This picture, that little plume just through the windscreen is um, Mount Etna um, bursting into life. The last most recent trip was to Morocco. It was a fabulous trip. I should have done it with Michael Marshall in his Minerva, but sadly he died just before the trip and I couldn't do it. And Martin Gosling very generously let me come with him and his wife Annette in their Robin DR400, which you see in the background. Martin generously allowed me to share the flying and gosh, we saw some fabulous scenery. And I've just put in a few photographs to show you some of the views and to perhaps enthuse you into flying into Morocco. We went right to the south onto the border with Algeria, into the Sahara, which was magical. We flew to Fez, we went to Tangiers, we went to Marrakesh. Everywhere we went, it was absolutely breathtaking scenery. Verdant to the north on the coastal regions, desert to the south. All of the runways seemed to be about three miles long and they were just wonderful. Refueling was a bit like at the Cambridge Aero Club. Um, all by hand from a little Bowser. Notice that like Cambridge Airport, everybody does their high-vis jackets up properly. When we got to Tangiers, one of our chums in a Cessna 182 had a problem. He'd flown through turbulence and his head had gone through the window at the top of the cockpit. So we needed to make a new window. Here you see me making the new window, dutifully not doing up my high-vis jacket. And you might wonder where the perspex came from. Well, it came from this runway marker that we found by the side of the runway. So if you go to Tangier, which is a big commercial airport, and find a runway marker with a hole in it, you know where it's went, where it's gone. There you see Annette Gosling in the back, a bit of Martin Gosling and me, fat, dumb and happy in the Robin, enjoying life enormously. And this, I guess, is the tale of my second engine failure. It was entirely my fault, I know. The way we operated the aeroplane, the way Martin operates the aeroplane, he runs one tank to nearly dry. He waits till the warning light comes on, then runs it for 15 minutes and then switches tanks. Carelessly, when I got into the, into the aeroplane, I probably flipped the switch from day to night so when the warning light came on, I didn't see it come on. At 5,000 feet in the cruise, suddenly it all went quiet. My hands moved rather fast, changing tanks, mixed it fully rich, um, booster pump on, luckily it came to life again. I think Martin's probably forgiven me, but gosh, it made our hearts stop briefly. I was delighted with fellow Air Squadron member Roddy Bloys to win the Guernsey Air Rally in 2018. Roddy and I planned to fly it again, but COVID prevented us doing the Guernsey Air Rally. And sadly, he died last year, so we won't do it and win it again. And to finish, and I am about to finish, one or two unusual aeroplanes. I really enjoyed flying the Edgley Optica. Sadly, I didn't fly Ego. I was chairman of the company for about a year and I'd have really loved to have flown that. I regularly fly a Tiger Moth today, thanks to Henry Labuschere. And Henry very generously allowed me to fly 
um, the 1930 de Havilland 60, the speed model that Alan Butler came second in in the 1930 um, King's Cup air race. When I'm not flying airplanes and working as managing director of the Cambridge Aero Club, I'm the honorary commander at RAF Lakenheath. I'm not gonna fly an F-35, but gosh, I hope they let me fly an F-15 before I retire from the job in June. The last silly thing, and it wasn't a silly thing at all that I did in an airplane, was go wing walking. I did that four years ago with Dave Barrell, who we taught to fly at the Cambridge Aero Club and is now the chief pilot of, um, of the Breitling um, um, team, the wing walkers. Gosh, it was a wonderful flight. Dave's brief to me was wave your hands above your head. As long as you're waving your hands above your head, I know you're okay. As soon as they're at your side, I'll stop and land. So we looped, we rolled, I giggled with laughter. I waved my arms madly, wanting him to continue forever. But eventually we had to land because of fuel. And I think this, my last slide, probably sums it all up. It's American, of course. Mummy, when I grow up, I want to be a pilot. I'm sorry, son, you can't do both. Well, ladies and gentlemen, friends, I've probably spoken for far too long. That's the end of my talk. And if any of you would like to ask any questions, I think Mike will unmute you or facilitate questions, but I think we'll draw stumps in any event in about 15 minutes or so. Are there any questions? One there. The one from Amanda, I think, uh, Terry. Aha. Hello, Terry. Hello, Amanda. Uh, fabulous. You will have to come and fly with my tiger. Um, and I'll be marking you on the landings. Oh, well, I want, I want to fly your tiger. And I was pleased to see photographs of it flying on Saturday. Yes, yes. We, we got it out finally because uh, the weather was nice. So mm. we, uh, we uh, did it. Um, a, a few uh, a few paperwork issues. I wish I could be like you and and uh, fly in the old days where you didn't have to uh, worry about paperwork. But my question is, what is your favourite? What was your favourite aircraft? I, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult. So many people over the years, when I've given talks on cruise ships and various other places, ask the same question. It would almost be glib to say it was the Spitfire. I think the Spitfire had the most impact on me because it was such a special airplane and it was such a special flight and it was so memorable. Oh. But actually, uh, I think my most favourite airplane, because I've done so much with it and with Michael Marshall, is probably the Rally Minerva. But I've got so much affection for so many of the, air of the airplanes I've flown. Uh, that Booker Jungmeister was a very special airplane. And I might have told in my talk another little tale, which I'll tell now. Um, I did the display at Silverstone with a chap called Ralph Hubbard. Um, he was in Tiger Moth and it wasn't much of a display, but we were sort of formating with each other. And the brief was that I didn't know where Rob's Lamplow strip at Hungerford was, but Ralph did. And he said, when we finish the display, just formate on me and I'll lead you to, um, to Hungerford. And he did. What he didn't tell me was that he'd been a pupil at Stowe School. And if anybody listening knows Stowe School, they'll know there's a, a large wide avenue of very tall trees which go up to about a hundred foot tall. <laughs> and they're probably about um, 50 foot wide. Ralph at about um, 30 foot above the ground led me down this tunnel of trees. I had to slip into line astern rather than an echelon because I was a bit worried about the trees to one side. I think we gave the boys at the school a real treat as we buzzed past them. Anyway, that was a long answer to your question. I've loved them all, Amanda. I just love flying. Thank you very much, Terry. Next is uh, Rick, Rick Peacock. Can you hear me? I can, Rick, hello. Hello, Terry. Well, Terry, thank you very much. I mean, you and I have known each other for 50 years plus, probably. Um, we, we were born in the same year, in the same month even, and we've been good friends for a very long time. I really enjoyed your talk there. That was absolutely fantastic. 
you got 11,000 hours. And I must admit that was a, it was absolutely fascinating. I've got seven and a half thousand hours after 34 years flying fighters in the RAF. So I can tell you that, you know, I thought my life was exciting, but I think your life is probably even more exciting. But I got one question. I noticed you, you were a, a Holton brat and there's nothing better in this world than being a Holton brat. They are, they are the best. There's no doubt about it whatsoever. But you progressed from there and, uh, and, and retired and went on to glory, glory, glory. But why, why, what I can't understand is why we knew each other in the Air Force. You should have been a pilot in the Air Force. Why weren't you? Oh, I, I wish I had been, Rick. Nothing would have given me greater pleasure. It's all I wanted. When I graduated from Holton, I was selected for commissioning and I went to Officers and Air Crew Selection Centre and they said I was slightly colourblind. It wasn't very colourblind because in later years it didn't prevent me from getting a class one medical as a route towards a commercial pilot's licence. Um, but the RAF was so picky, I just failed that funny little test with the find the the lady wearing the hat or the numbers on the chart and they wouldn't let me do it and it was a huge sadness it's all i wanted to do but one correction to what you said and thanks for your kind words it's not eleven thousand; it's just under ten thousand. but i've enjoyed every second of it and thanks for your kindness in saying you enjoyed the talk rick it was a pleasure giving it i did it was fantastic thank you terry Thanks. I don't think we have any more questions yet. I uh, know Anthony uh, is keen to say a few words, though. If I just unmute him. Oh, just right. um, yeah, the title of tonight's presentation, 60 Years Have Flown By. Well, the last 60 minutes have certainly flown by. Um, Terry, your life so far in aviation has been what most of us only dream of, and I don't think 60 minutes really does it justice. I think you need to come back and talk to us again with a few more stories. On behalf of everyone here, thank you very much. It was fantastic. Um, quickly back to Mike, please. Yeah, it's got another question from David Allison as well. David, if you need... Terry, yeah. Terry David here. <clears throat> I, Hello, it's, David. Not a, it's not a question. It's just to say what you haven't alluded to is how many, how kind you've been to people along the route of your journey. And you've certainly been a good friend to me and given loads of experiences and opportunity to others. So I just want to say thank you for that. And I've loved your talk. Thank you. Well, th thank, thank you, David. And that gives me an opportunity to, through you, to thank your father because your father was very generous to me. And I've flown, well, quite a lot of his airplanes. Um, the, uh, the Gemini, has a wonderful memory. His um, single seat yak was a real treat and the Luton Minor. Um, I've enjoyed our, our friendship over many years, David, and uh, I'm delighted that you were able to take advantage of the Jodel at, at Vista when you were a champion glider pilot moving into power flying. Thanks for your kind words. Um. Got one more question there, Terry. So there's, there's quite a few messages of people saying, you know, thanks very much and well worth reading. Um, but there's one from Gary Jackson asking, where would you love to fly to next and why? Oh, it's a very good question. Well, I can tell you, Gary, that I'm uh, I'm planning to go to a 2K on the, on the 6th of May for dinner um, and be there for the weekend. I'm planning to go to um, La Rochelle on the 15th of May and be there for a week. I'm certainly going to Portugal in the in the early part of October in a Cessna 172 with the chum Nigel Bairstow with Mary and my wife sitting in the back. Um, that's just for this year. I want desperately to go to Iceland. We staged through Iceland on the way to um, America in 2000 and I think Iceland is a destination that's worth going to to stop in. I'd really like to plan to go to Iceland probably next year and spend spend a week there. I'd also like to go back to the United States and fly over there again. The United States is just a wonderful 
country to fly in, particularly if you've got an American license. Um, they're very welcoming, very friendly. The FBOs are just perfect. And to be able to do some of the things I've done in North America, I just love to go and do some more of it. So that's the, that's the short answer. Okay, there are no more questions at the moment. So unless anyone else well, wants to shout out. Well, in, in which case, I think um, I'd like to thank Anthony for his kind words. I Yes, of course, I'd love to come again. Um, here's the advertisement for the next talks. There will be a Gasco safety evening talk on the evening of Tuesday, the 15th of March. And sitting behind me, because he thought it was a live lecture, is Stu Reed, who is in the one and nines, along with John Priest. Um, they've been sort of muted and fairly quiet, although I knew I'd made a few funny remarks because Stu giggled once or twice. Stu's going to be giving a lecture in April. And anyone, if you've not got a copy of Stu Reed's book, it's a fabulous read. You must get a copy of it. Um, I can't remember the title of it. It's something like Sunrise at Dusk. Sunrise at Dusk. And I mean, it's an amazing book. I've... Um, I got it a week and a half ago. And uh, anyway, Stu's going to be talking to us. And some of the stories in Stu's book will be at the talk um, in April. We've yet to fix a date. Well, with that, I think we are probably out of time. Thank you, everybody, for coming to listen. Um, thanks for your friendship. And stay safe. Fly safe. Um, it's still great fun. Good night, everybody.